Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in. I'm Matan from Firebolt, and I'm leading the solution architecture team and in EMEA. And today, in this live stream, we're going to talk about specific down to earth. Uh, optimization techniques that we can use to optimize our data warehouse, specifically for the vertical of data applications, but definitely could be useful for multiple different use cases as well. This session is dedicated to the real examples. We're going to go through some real code and the real technical implementation that stands uh, behind the ideas of those optimizations. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. I want to start with this quote from a recent Google search because it really captures what we're talking about today. Essentially what it says that data applications have only a grace of around three seconds to deliver on whatever the user is trying to search using the app, right? We're living in a very interactive, snappy world. And if you don't deliver on time, then the user won't be there um, to wait for the answer to come back, right? So we want to make sure that whatever the use case is, and it doesn't matter the scale or the variety of the analytics, for example, you need to make sure that you deliver uh, in time. All right, so before we talk about the real optimization techniques, let's talk first about what qualifies as a warehouse-based data application. So first thing might sound kind of straightforward. We wanna make sure that we're using data warehouse as a backend for our data applications, right? This is just an opposite to have cases where, for example, someone would use a caching layer or some other operational database as their backend for the data application. This is um, usually would be a relational column-based data warehouse for analytical purposes that will serve as the backend for the analytical requests um, as part of the data application. Second thing that will qualify the use case as a warehouse-based data application is the fact that it's customer facing, right? Rather than some sort of an internal BI. So your application is serving your external customers, and that actually has a lot of implications on the use case, which we'll talk about in a second. And the third thing is that you're actually serving analytics, right? Usually, we're not talking about those really simple, you know, a few data points, data applications. We're talking about real analytics, you know, all those different widgets scanning a lot of data under the hood running some really sophisticated analytics, as well as enabling our users to slice and dice the existing data in order to pinpoint what they're looking for within the, uh, the data set that you are exposing to them. So the last thing is the fact that the actual data application is serving some advanced analytics. Now, we talked about what qualifies as data application, but let's talk about the characteristics of data app use case. So the first thing is that essentially it's all about performance, right? We do have some other considerations, but really it comes down to performance, right? Because you are, like we said, serving your external customers. So the most important thing is to deliver in time, right? So your schema, the entire workload will be orchestrated and constructed to deliver in as performant as possible. Second thing is that I call it flexible use of a well-defined data model. Usually the, what I mean by well-defined data model is the schema itself in terms of the different object tables that exist there, usually it's quite static, right? In data app use case, right? We don't tend to see a lot of tables being added to, um, a data app use case on a daily basis, right? But in terms of the actual usage of the schema, that could be quite flexible. We can see a very large variety of queries being executed on the existing, existing schema, uh, right? All those different queries, and that might change quite rapidly. So that's what I mean by flexible use of well-defined data model. And lastly, 
big data. This is one of the biggest characteristics we're seeing recently in the most modern data apps. The data is simply growing every day, right? Use cases that used to have um, gigs of data now have hundreds of gigs and from hundreds of gigs, it goes to terabytes and so on and so on. And this really is the cornerstone of the challenge that we're gonna talk about today. How can we deal with this big data and still deliver uh, on the performance? I uh, want to add some examples of data applications. So these are some screenshots. So usually we'll have all those really cool widgets um, and we'll present the different charts and the data points. But naturally, one of the biggest parts of a data applications is the ability um, to allow the users to slice and dice and to decide on what specific subset of data are they looking for within the, the exposed data set. The more granular functionality we wish to allow our users in terms of filtering, the more usually it's complicated to deliver on performance. All right, so let's talk about the specific four techniques that we're gonna walk through today as part of this session. Number one is improve data pruning using clustered indexes. Number two, eliminate joins using arrays. Number three, accelerate upserts using partitions. And number four is schema evolution using JSON and Lambda functions. So without further ado, let's dive in and talk about the techniques themselves. So the first one we're going to discuss, like I said, is improved data pruning using clustered indexes. So before we actually talk about the technique itself, I want to start by talking a little bit about what is data pruning and what is clustered indexes. So first of all, what is data pruning? Uh, when we are scanning table, right, trying to fetch data as part of a read query, we will scan the table and most, most often we will filter it using some sort of a, a word clause. Um, data pruning is the technique that is used under the hood by the query engine to make sure it scans only the specific data parts that are relevant for this specific query execution, right? Because we know that uh, table scan is usually the most consuming in terms of time and resources. So the more we can prune the query, the more we can ensure that we only read the relevant data parts, the more we can save actual in actual runtime, right? And one of the most relevant tools uh, is clustered indexes. Now I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the concept of indexes. So let's just talk about what is clustered index specifically. Clustered index is an index that the order of the index itself is correlated to the order of the data parts. That is important and relevant because it means that it can allow us a more linear access to our data. So for example, if we run a query over a certain table and we are filtering for a date range, right? We'll have a much easier access to the sequential dates once we identify the initial one, right? So in cases where we are filtering for ranges for our data and the data and the ranges are sequential, a, a clustered index will really come uh, into our help in terms of delivering on performance and doing the specific thing of data pruning. All right, so let's talk about a real example of how we could define a clustered index um, and most importantly, how we choose the specific index that will be right for our use case. Now, just uh, clustered index is the term from uh, vendors like Snowflake, for example, uh, but every vendor will call it a little bit differently. In Firebolt, we call it primary index. In Redshift, it is called sorted index. So just um, the naming itself might change, but the concept here should be the same. So here's a quick example how we create a table with 
for example, in Firebolt, it would be a primary index. Naturally, a primary index doesn't have to be just one column. Usually, it will be a composition of a few columns. And we need to take into consideration that it's not only relevant which specific columns will be part of our index, but also what is the order of the columns within this index. So I want to talk now about the factors for picking the best column for your index, not only which column should participate, but all, also how do we rank them from the first one to the last one. So the first thing we need to take into consideration will, when picking our columns is the usage frequency. I would say this is the most important factor simply because if you are not using this, those columns, then putting them within your clustered indexes really won't be beneficial at all. Now, when I'm saying the actual usage, I'm talking mostly about how commonly are you filtering by those columns, but also are you using them for to, uh, to join between two, two tables or to uh, sort data? Um, how you could potentially discover the frequency of those usages is just analyzing your workload, you know, your query log or query history and trying to understand what's the ratio of using a certain column out of the entire workload. And based on that, you can potentially get a map of how frequently you're using each column, right? The more you're using it to filter data, the more it would make sense to use it within your uh, primary index and more specifically in uh, one of the first position within your primary index. So the second fact factor to take uh, into consideration is the values granularity. Now this is quite tricky because we wanna make sure that the column is quite granular, but not too granular. Let me explain what I mean by this. For example, if we would have a column, like a Boolean column, right, with only two possible values, when actually we would look to query the specific table and filter using this column, in terms of data pruning, all we will get is pruning of half of the table. This might sound useful, but still, in cases when we're talking about really large data sets, half of the table still probably means terabytes of data, right? And we don't want to scan terabytes of data, right? So something that is not very granular won't work in our favor. But then on the other side, in cases where we have columns which, we, which are very granular, for example, like primary keys, then the actual time they will take the engine to scan the index itself might present some sort of an overhead for our query execution, although eventually finding the correlated row won't take as long, right? So we want to make sure we find something in between in terms of granularity. We'll always prefer more granular than less, but then try to pay attention to something that perhaps is too granular. Although I should say, in some cases, it works as well. Um, this is just a quick example of how you can discover a column's granularity given that in some vendors, this sort of metrics are not provided uh, by default. And the last factor we need to take into consideration is the column data type and length. Uh, naturally, we would prefer numeric and dates data types over textual fields. And for textual fields, we would prefer shorter text rather than longer, longer ones. Um, this obviously shouldn't be your primary factor. If the number one field you're using for filtering a specific table is textual, use that as the first position within your primary index. Uh, just pay attention that the data type and the length of the value also is um, relevant uh, for choosing your best primary index. All right, so this is the first techniques uh, using clustered indexes for improving data pruning. All right, second technique, how can we eliminate join queries using arrays? All right, so joins, as probably 
everyone um, here are familiar with are a very common um, technique in the data analysis world. And data applications are also something that sees more and more joins recently, right? We um, inspire to enrich the data as much as possible. That means that uh, we should quite often join two different tables to enrich the, the result set. Problem with joins is mostly on performance. Joins are uh, known to be execution bottlenecks, especially in cases where the join relationship is one or many to many, and or in cases where we have really large tables that are involved in our join operations. So what we usually do in order to optimize the join queries in a data app scenario is we pre-join the tables, right? We could potentially flatten two tables into one. And then when actually querying the data as part of the read queries, we only scan one table, which usually saves quite a lot of time. The problem here with pre-joins objects is that very often the relationship between them is not one to one. And then if it's one to many, for example, we're risking in exploding, for example, our fact table, which could be quite big as it is, and multiply the number of, of records uh, by the number of records that we have in relation within, for example, a dimension table, right? So we might end up from a few terabytes table, we might end up with a few dozen terabytes, for example, changing the scale completely. So I wanna talk specifically today about how we can use arrays and semi-structured objects uh, in combination with Lambda functions in order to pre-join tables more efficiently and then not compromise on um, you know, the storage, not exploiting the objects, but also getting the performance that we want for our data application. So for that, let's talk about, let's explore this specific example. What we see here is two tables. The right one right here, let's call it products. What we have here essentially, this is a small dimension tables, table. And within this table, what we have for every product on a daily basis, we'll have the product price. So this is why we'll see for, for example, for our Tesla, we'll see for January 1st, the, 10, the price was 10. And then on January 2nd, the price was 15. So this is a small dimension table. This is our orders table. Well, what we see here is for every order, we'll see all the products that were part of this order. This is naturally will be a large fact table. Um, and let's talk about a specific use case. So let's say that um, the business logic that is required here is the question was asked what, uh, for each order, what is the total price difference comparing to the day before, right? So in the most conventional way, when we're talking about join queries, this is how we would have done it. We would join the order products table with the products table, right? We will do it based on product ID. We would filter uh, for the specific two dates that are required by this day and the day before. And then we'll use some sort of a sum case, you know, select in order to get the ratio of this day comparing to the day before. So this is how we would have done that using a join query traditionally and potentially paying the, the fine of running a join query on the fly, right? So now we wanna talk about how we could potentially uh, combine these two tables together into one flattened table and keep in mind the challenge, which if we will join based on the product ID, for example, we are risking with exploding the fact table and multiplying it with the number of records that we have for each product ID within our dimension table. But if we will use arrays for this example, we could make sure we maintain the same number of records 
within orders products as it used to be. Only now we added a couple more fields which are nested. So we will pre-join the tables, but we will make sure that, for example, product dates and product prices will be nested into arrays just like this, right? And we can take care of that as part of a pre-join insert query into the table rather than as part of our select statements. So this is how the table, the flattened table would look like. And then based on that, what we could do potentially is run this query, which you can see now is only scanning one table. Then we can use a few um, array index functions to access the specific relevant product prices and calculate the same um, equation as we did before, but now based on the arrays that are part of our table. Now, actually, let's take this one one step further and let's say not only we want to get um, a price comparison um, comparing to the day before, let's say for every order and every product, I want to get the full history of prices difference. Right, so what I could do in this specific example, um, I could potentially use those Lambda functions in order to parse the, um, the nested fields that I have, the arrays, in order to get what I want. So what we have here as a first Lambda function is something called array sort. We are essentially sorting the product prices array according to the product dates array. And then once we've done that, we are transforming the sorted product prices to be instead of just array of prices into array of, of price differences. So this is exactly what we see here. And in this case, not only we are enjoying the performance of the fact that we pre-joined using arrays, we're also are probably able to achieve this functionality much easier, given that now these two data sets are merged and in the matter we have merged them. So this is definitely something that is recommended as long as it makes sense from your um, joint functionality in your data applications. All right, third technique, how can we accelerate upsets using partitions? So, Let's start with talking about what upsert is, um, update plus insert, right? Um, a very common technique to make sure our data is up to date um, and to maintain our continuous ingestion. Usually we'll have some sort of a primary key for a specific table that we would like to update. And based on this primary key, we will update existing keys and we will insert new keys, right? So this is the specific example that we see here. Usually it will look like this, merge into some sort of a table. And then based on the key, we will, the engine will know which keys should be updated and which one are new and should be inserted. The problem with upsert functionality is that it is usually very consuming in terms of resources, right? Even in cases where we have uh, full separation of storage and compute, and we are able to dedicate a resource specifically for our continuous ingestion effort, usually this effort tends to be really, really expensive, right? And especially in cases where we have the inge continuous ingestion effort um, on the same resource as our data applications, they tend to run into each other, right? So I want to talk about how we could potentially keep our data up to date, but without running those frequent upsets on our data. This technique is essentially based on running inserts, which are append only. So naturally much less heavy in terms of resources utilization. And also on, on a selected, um, time window running a drop partition to make sure our data is up to date. And I'll explain the specific steps right now. So the first step is to ensure that for the destination table that we would like to continuously upsert, um, 
this table needs to have a partition on it. So in our example here, we have this table partitioned by date. Second step will be to create an empty replication of our destination table. I'll explain in a second why do we need this replication, but essentially this would be some sort of a staging or a daily object that we will interact with on a daily basis. And then we will combine these two objects into one in order to enable the analytical procedure that we were looking for. But we start with one destination table, which will be our permanent one, and one table, which will be an empty replication, which we will call data table. Then what we do based on the frequency on which we would like to insert data, we interact with the daily object uh, but rather than doing an upsert, we are doing an if insert. And again, insert into this table should be much, much better in terms of performance and resources utilization. It will probably look like something like this, right? Insert into the daily object from the external table. And we filter only for the files that were updated in the most recent hour. So in this case, we have the frequency of the ingestion is hourly base, but this naturally might change, depends on the use case. Now, what we do is we create a view that will do a union between those two objects to create the same functionality as if we would do frequent upserts on one table. So it will look like this. The union will be selecting from the daily objects what we need to make sure that we do for the daily object is that we filter for the most recent um, record for each primary key, simply because when we're doing inserts rather than upserts, there might be cases where we have duplications. So we wanna make sure that we are filtering for the most recent record. This makes sense from a perf performance perspective because the daily object should be much, much smaller. Uh, and then running this query on the fly should be quite performant. And then the second part of our union is actually fetching data from the permanent table. But what we need to do is we need to verify that the primary key does not exist in the daily object, because if it does exist there, then there's only already a newer record for uh, this specific ID. And then the combination using this logic should ensure that this view essentially is representing an updated version of uh, the table that we wish to update. Then what we need to do based on some predefined maintenance window that should take place in the off hours we should do some sort of a flip-flop between those two tables to make sure um, everything is up to date and tidy up and then we're ready for the next day. It will look like something like this. Essentially what we do is we insert the most updated records from the daily table into the permanent table. And then we um, truncate the daily object. Um, and now we have, um, um, an updated version of our permanent table uh, where we have everything up to date with uh, only the most recent records for each, uh, only the most re recent um, records for each ID. Um, and the daily table is empty again and we are ready to start the cycle again. And then lastly, all we really need to do is to make sure that we point our analytical queries to the view instead of the table itself. And potentially this is all we need to do. Now I know that this sort of technique won't be useful for everyone, but I would definitely encourage to explore it in cases where you identify your upsert to be one of the bottlenecks in terms of performance or cost, by the way. Um, so definitely if that's the case for you, uh, I would encourage exploring this technique. All right, last technique, the fourth one, 
schema evolution using JSON and Lambda functions. So we discussed earlier that usually the schemas of uh, a data app use cases are quite well defined, meaning that we're not adding new objects, new tables on a daily basis, but changes to existing objects, like for example, adding new columns is quite, um, happens quite often. Um, and again, the more frequently we do that, the more it could be in a way in terms of um, you know, performance and making sure everything is up to date and all the maintenance that is required around it. Um, so I wanted to suggest um, a specific technique of using JSONs and then Lambda functions in order to basically um, support this ever-changing uh, schema or specific tables. The idea basically is to add a JSON column to your relational table, right? So we already have relational table with a bunch of columns, a bunch of metrics. But then on top of that, we add an additional JSON column, which will be for our dynamic and changing attributes. This JSON will be able to query it on the fly and parse it. And then um, when we are, for example, adding new metrics to our tables, rather than adding new columns, we'll be able to add the, the new key and value to the existing JSON and will be much more efficient. The challenge here naturally is how do we maintain performance when parsing JSON on the fly, which is exactly what I wanna talk about now. So here's the techniques or some of the tips that I can give uh, of how you can use the flexibility of JSONs without compromising the performance of your data applications. So first up, obviously is to define a JSON column as part of your table creation. Uh, it will look like something like this, right? We have a few relational columns, but then right next to it, we have the JSON column uh, where we would hold the dynamic fields. Now, the JSON, like I said, would hold a dynamic list of keys and values. And what we wanna make sure when we go with this sort of a JSON is that we keep within the JSON only the necessary keys and values um, for uh, our analytical workload. The reason is the more keys or the longer the JSON is, um, the more time it would take to parse this JSON on the fly when reading the data, right? So one thing which is very crucial and very often people ignore this step, is to make sure that every key that you have already pre-extracted from the JSON into your table, into a relational column, essentially, make sure you remove this field from the JSON, right? To narrow down the JSON. Um, um, if you have this column as a relational column now, then you can get it from there and there's no need for it to exist within your JSON. So how can we do that? Is a really cool way to do that in Firebolt, but naturally I believe there are other ways and some other vendors. Basically what we do is when inserting the data into the JSON column or the table itself and the JSON column included, what we do is we use a function to extract the keys from the JSON and also the values. And then we filter from those correlated lists, the columns that were already pre-extracted. And then we wrap, we transform those two arrays into um, uh, a JSON. We join all of the key value pairs into a JSON. And we basically uh, deconstruct and construct it again, but now without the columns that were uh, already pre-extracted. So this is the first technique, which I would say very crucial to maintain the JSONs and making sure that they only hold the keys that they should. Second technique, which I would say is quite extreme, but could be relevant in cases where 
you have just uh, a lot of keys in your JSONs and you would like to potentially distribute them, what we could do is create some sort of uh, hash table, um, essentially splitting our JSONs, our JSON column into a subset of um, or buckets of a few um, subset JSONs and every JSON will hold um, a few keys based on uh, some functionality. So for example, let's say I have a JSON with 100 uh, pairs of keys and values, which is quite big to parse on the fly, right? When we're looking to parse a specific field from it, what we could do potentially is create 10 different JSON columns, right? From, zero, uh, from JSON zero all the way to JSON nine. And then when inserting data into the JSON columns, we can run a hash function, for example, on the JSON key. And then using some sort of a modular function, we could allocate each JSON key to an appropriate um, subset JSON column. And by that, we could redistribute the JSON um, into smaller subset columns. The disadvantage of this method is the fact that we will need to know ahead of running our select query, which key belongs to each um, subset column. Uh, but if you do have the ability to, to know that ahead of time, for example, if you run the hash function externally from the warehouse to detect the, um, the JSON column, then I would definitely recommend it uh, because again, the name of the game is to reduce the JSON as much as possible. Very last technique would be to try and basically save the JSON as text and filter it as text rather than um, a JSON column or to parse it as JSON. This is relevant for cases where there isn't um, a default support in JSONB or JSON data types, for example, then we know that if we save the JSON as text and then try to parse it as JSON on the fly, it requires the engine to actually first construct the JSON, uh, the text as JSON. So a, a first compilation step, and then only then we do the extract. Where if all we are looking for is to filter the JSON for a specific value, we could do something that looks like this. We could filter the JSON text for the pair of the key and the value. And then potentially you could run faster than uh, doing an extract. And then based on the extract, doing some equal filter um, and getting the same results. So this is again relevant for cases where we're using um, JSON as textual fields. Um, but also in those cases, um, in the select statement itself, we could still run a JSON extract to uh, get specific fields, right? So essentially it's only something we could use as part of filtering the JSON. That's all I had today. Um, I hope the techniques were uh, down to earth enough and useful for you guys. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions um, or anything else you'd like me to elaborate about. Uh, so thank you again for joining this live stream and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.